there are times when I have, I don't know if worried is the right word, but I've imagined the possibility that one day we make contact with an alien civilization and they say, hey, show us what you guys have figured out. And we bring out the textbooks with all of our beautiful equations and they kind of look at it and they go, nah. They put you in a video where you're the dog. <laughs> yeah, right. They basically, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, they, they basically say, you know, we, we tried that for a while. It's kind of a dead end, guys. It'll take you just so far. Yeah. But then the funny thing is, if I try to imagine what they would replace it with, I don't even, I can't even think of what they would replace it with that isn't in some sense mathematics, perhaps in an unrecognizable form or an unfamiliar form, perhaps a better way of saying it, because if math is a language of pattern, what are we doing? We're all just trying to encapsulate patterns. So whatever language you use to do that, maybe that is what math ultimately should be described as and therefore will always be back to this kind of structure. Right. There's another physicist who I've spoken with on my podcast a couple of times, David Deutsch, who I know you know. Um, and I, for, uh, forgive me, David, I've forgotten the reason why you believe this, but I believe he thinks that we are, um, we're, there, in principle, we, can, we as math using language forming cognitive systems are not cognitively closed to anything that could be known, given, I mean, I, th I think it has, in his mind, something to do with, with a, a, a deep result around information theory and the universality of computation. I mean, but I, I, I don't think I can represent his view faithfully here. But he, the, the net result is he thinks that the notion that we could meet an alien intelligence or build a super intelligent computer that we couldn't understand on some level, that where we would stand as the dog in relation to that super intelligent system, he thinks that's a, a, uh, a false fear or, or just in principle impossible. Do you have any reason to, to feel that? Or? I mean, I have to understand more fully exactly what he's saying, but I mean, clearly, if you take our very species and you just, you know, wind the clock back however far you want to go, 30,000 years, 50,000 years, 70,000 years, I mean, there would be a cognitive mismatch relative to where we are today. Yeah. So it's certainly the case that given enough time, we can get to the point, obviously, here we right. are. But I could certainly imagine that we encounter an alien intelligence and they are exponentially beyond anything that we have understood, and therefore we would be like ants. Yeah. And in fact, I think that's a good possibility as to why they're not paying attention to us. Well, I, th I think that's part of his argument, yeah. I, I actually, that takes me exactly where I want to go, but I, I think that is part of his argument that we're given enough time or given enough you know, augmentation of ourselves, we could fuse our cognitive horizon with anything else that we could meet. Um, but on, so on that point, where the hell is everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 maybe you, you can remind people what the Fermi problem is and, and then tell us what you... Yeah, uh, you know, and, Enrico Fermi, a uh, great physicist, uh, is credited with, it's usually framed as the Fermi paradox, I guess, uh, which is, look, there's so many stars out there, so many, in fact, now we know for, for a fact that there are so many planetary systems out there, Therefore, you expect there's a lot of life out there. Where are they? Why haven't they come and visited us? It's sort of a you know, quick way of describing uh, the question. And, um, but yeah, I think uh, uh, it's an interesting thought to, to contemplate. I think there are many, many explanations for, for why they haven't come here. It could be, like I was saying, we're just not interesting enough, right? I mean, how many times... Do we stop on the street and, and, and have conversations with bacteria, right? So if we're bacteria, you know, they're like, let's wait, you know, you know, a billion years and maybe at that point we'll pay some attention. But there are other explanations too. I mean, maybe uh, life is rare, right? I mean, we always have this idea in mind, I think, that at this point life is commonplace. Well, we don't know that. Or maybe life is commonplace, but intelligent life is rare. Right? I mean, if that asteroid hadn't smashed into us 65 million years ago, who knows? Maybe it's still dinosaurs walking around and they're not building radio telescopes and sending out spaceships. You know, the other possibilities are, are, are legion. I mean, 
the universe now, 92 billion light years across, the observable universe in terms of the things that we've had calls of contact with, we have traveled one and a half light seconds <laughs> from Earth. We have sent out probes that have gone out, I don't know, five or six light hours. Right. So to say, why aren't they here? The universe is a big place. And it's not so easy to travel over large distances if you're constrained by the barrier of the speed of light. So what, what's, the, what's our furthest impact on the universe? Just bad television from 70 years ago? Is that? Uh, yeah, so, so if you take, well, seven, so, no, I mean, I guess TV, you know, radio signals. Go, go back to, say, to 1900 something. So maybe, you know, generously, 150 light years, if you allow, you know, any transmission that we sent out there. That's so 150 light years compared to, you know, 92 billion light years, yeah. right? That's not much. Although I, I, the intuition is that if, because if you, you look at the, the fact that we have gone from you know, barely walking upright to sending out our own space probes in a very short period of time, so you know, 300 years of, of practical science, really. Yeah. And if you think of any, so, so I guess the one assumption you need is that there's nothing really special about Earth. And more and more, it seems that the sense, I mean, even 10 years ago, Earth seemed more special than it does now. Now we're finding planets every day that are seemingly in, in a, some kind of Goldilocks zone with respect to their star. And so if you don't think the conditions on Earth are so special, that they're really a dime a dozen out there in the galaxy and in other galaxies, and then you think the, just we're talking about a time window of, you know, any, any place where life gets going and, and it gets complex is very likely on, it could, could be millions of years on either side of us. Anything, anything that's complex that could build a civilization, you know, is, is not going to, that is very unlikely to have happened in the last 300 years. They, yeah. they, they might as well have, you know, 300 years plus 10 million years to have gotten that going, right? So then you, you would expect just the galaxy to be awash in something that we could detect, right, that has been going on for millions of years. Um, I guess the one, the, the one additional wrinkle that, that we haven't mentioned is that there could just be something about building a complex civilization, building technology that is lethal yep. to species like ourselves. A absolutely. It could be that they're... We're you know, showing every a, sign of it being, being dangerous. Uh, yeah, right, point, right, yeah. right, exactly. I mean, it could be that once you get to the point where you're able to undertake these kind of grand space journeys, you're in a very dangerous situation, and typically you don't survive. Um, there, are, there are more optimistic ways of, of explaining it, though, too. So maybe the universe is teeming with all this activity, it's just not in the wavelengths that we're looking. We're just not right. sensitive to it, right? Maybe the time scales over which the vibrations of whatever medium that they're using are, are incredibly long or incredibly short. So we just hear it as like noise in the background and don't recognize that there's a signal or we don't even have any sensitivity to it at all. Right. So, so I think- Their bad television is coming at a different frequency? It could well be. Right, you know, um, so, so I, don't, I don't consider it a paradox. I think it's an interesting point of departure in trying to understand whether we're special, whether life is special, whether intelligence is special. But I mean, from your perspective, right, um, uh, let's say life is commonplace. The journey from life to intelligence is non-trivial. Do you think yeah. that is uh, as straightforward as you might assume in order to come to the conclusion that there should be all sorts of intelligence out there. Well, looking at Earth, you wouldn't draw that conclusion. I mean, Why? Even, even Why do you say that? How well, many species are there on this planet? Well, no, I'm saying, I'm, I, so I, I think I'm agreeing with you. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. that it's, it, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, the truth is I'm even, it's non-trivial even if you look at our own species. Yes, that, that, that's the point. You know? Good, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if, uh, you murdered the top, if, if, you, if you took, so how many people on Earth at this moment deeply understand the science required to build intelligent machines, 
right? So if they, if they all caught a bad virus and died off, how long would it take just the people left to reinvent the computer, right? That's a, that's a non-trivial problem for most right. of us. I mean, if, you, if you leave me alone on a desert island with the, you know, the necessary elements, you're, still, you're not going to get a, an iPhone anytime soon. <laughs> uh, and um, so that, I mean, in some sense, we're, we're, all, we're all living on the shoulders of, you know, if not giants, on the shoulders of, of legacy institutions and, and ways of doing things that it would be very hard for anyone to recapitulate. I mean, any, even any group of, of especially talented, qualified people, uh, you know, just, you just you, you forget how to go, you know, yeah. mine the ore that you need to make that you know, the circuit, right? Uh, so, and that's even assuming the existence of us humans already. I mean, yeah. if you just get rid of that whole particular branch, then you don't even have anything heading in that direction. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it strikes me as incredibly tenuous and fragile, yeah. right? Uh, so, and by no means uh, guaranteed to, to keep happening. Uh, because, again, I mean, the thing that's, that's interesting is that it's, it, it doesn't... What, what we're using to do everything that makes us human is not obviously better from a Darwinian perspective as a matter of survival. I mean, because, you know, again, in the long run, we could wind up killing ourselves. Uh, and there are many things that have persisted as themselves, as, you know, as discrete species for tens of millions of years. You know, you take something like a lobster, right? Now, lobsters are just doing their lobster thing year after year after year, uh, and they seem to be fine unless we wind up you know, eating too many of them or destroying their environment. Uh, we, there, there's something uh, quite a bit more precarious about, about our place in the world. And, uh, yeah, so it's not, a, even just as a map on purely Darwinian grounds, it's not like this surfeit of intelligence and abstract thought is, is clearly something that evolution is an attractor that evolution will keep finding because it's, it's just so good for a right. matter of survival. Right. No, I agree. And I think that's a very natural explanation, uh, not the most uh, optimistic of ones, but yeah. certainly is an explanation. Well, I'm rarely accused of optimism, so... 